have a, a generous 40 minutes to talk with one another about Liz's wonderful talk that we just heard. Um, we've been asked uh, if we could perhaps stand for some of our comments just for ease of seeing and, and hearing. Uh, but we will also feel free to sit down as the need arises. Uh, there is a lot to engage here. Uh, I have a question, but I will first open it up to the, to the room on the assumption that there are lots of good questions in the room. Uh, so does someone want to get us started with the inquiry for one another or for those on the basis of what we just heard? Sarah? Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you a question as someone who teaches journalism um, and is really trying to help students figure out how to speak truth while also, um, you know, holding to certain journalistic virtues of, of balance and fairness and all of that. Um, and one model I've used is an old model, which you may well revise, and I think in some ways your talk has helped me think through better, but Daniel Hallen's model um, where there's a sphere of consensus. Um, a sphere of legitimate controversy, and then going further out, a sphere of deviance. Um, and one um, um, narrative I've heard about that model recently is that the sphere of consensus has shrunk considerably. <laughs> um, and even the sphere of legitimate controversy is shrinking. And then the sense of everyone, everything else is sort of deviance or really polarized has significantly expanded. So I wondered if you could um, maybe speak to that a little bit, or especially um, what is the sphere of consensus, or does it even still exist, from, from your perspective as a journalist and an editor? People still generally think that all of the core principles of liberalism are good. So everyone says that their side is on the side of freedom. Everyone says that their side is on the side of equality. Everyone says that their side is on the side of just being reasonable. Um, the problem is, it's almost that those things have been reduced down to um, just elements of pure language, right? That, that, that what underlies them is vastly different in each case. And in some cases, these are old controversies. You know, you have equality of opportunity, you have equality of outcome, you can use equality to describe both, but you're dealing with radically different ideas. Um, and then part of it is that political capabilities have changed. Uh, and then part of it is that the, the, the democracy is more and more a mass thing, right? I mean, so the, the sort of the filters are all off. So I think the sphere of deviance, I mean, anytime you add more people, you're adding more deviance. Um, and anytime you add more people, you're reducing consensus, right? Um, so I mean, now that, that we truly have a real mass democracy, I think it makes sense to have a shrinking of that sphere of consensus. Rawls talks about an overlapping consensus. Um, and I think another, you know, just sort of facet of human beings is that they're kind of ornery, um, and they um, they get together, and even when they agree, if there's something inside you that says like I'm not being agreed with in the way that fully recognizes what I mean, um, that bothers people, and it gets frictive. Um, and I think it's one of the functions of having public reason be kind of an unstated and submerged thing. And also having the sort of you know conference of doctrines of the you know, capital T truth is also sort of unstated and submerged. So I think there's internal and external friction that kind of extends from that. Um, so journalism itself it can be really difficult because you're you're navigating a lot of sources of tension at once um, for a mass democracy. But I mean I think the model is useful. I think it's helpful. Um, for people thinking about, you know, sort of first step approaches to, to problems that they're reporting on or writing about. Um, you know, the, the question that follows from that is, um, does the sphere of consensus, uh, sphere of legitimate controversy, and then the sphere of deviance, do these actually correspond to what I believe to be true, deviant, and controversial? Um, and I think that people should be able to answer those questions for themselves in a, in a very clear way. Um, and if they can't, then it's hard for them to think about them in a clear way and write about them in a clear way. Um, yeah, so you think it's a, still a useful model. I think mean, sort of several things have changed how it works. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you so much for this talk. It's very rich. And I wanted to go back to one of the first things you brought up about the relationship between language and thinking. And when you talk about people articulating their foundational beliefs, for instance, 
it has seemed to me that there are a lot of the words that any of us might use to do that that have be become so loaded and spun and battered and abused that they almost have to lie fallow for a while. And so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about strategies of reclaiming older language or refreshing new language or kind of inventiveness and subversiveness that needs to go into even finding the language to do what you say would be healthy for us to do. Yeah, so one of the, I, mean, I certainly know what you mean. One of the ideas that, uh, one of the words that comes immediately to mind is evil. Yeah. Um, and so I, I use evil when I mean it. And um, one of my friends is sort of, you know, someone who is a, another writer that I respect quite a bit. So it doesn't make sense to use evil. It's a, this is a Bush era term, right? I mean, the, the axis of evil and the terrorists of evil and everything that's bad is evil. Um, can't we just say this is harmful? Um, and I thought about it. I turned it over. And I came up with, like, no, we still need to use evil for a couple of reasons. One, um, because I mean something by evil that isn't encapsulated by harmful. So when I say that something is evil, I actually have in mind the turn towards non-being, the turn away from existence and to non-existence of destruction, right? Um, and that is actually what I mean when I talk about certain policies being evil, that they militate against flourishing, that they're uh, anti-life, you could say, another loaded term. Um, but that's really what I mean. And then secondly, it would really be a shame to give up the ability to talk about evil. Uh, and uh, what that kind of, you know, not to adopt a utilitarian thing altogether, but if you start giving up language that's very effective because it's been abused, then you're setting up a competition in which the people who can destroy the most language gain the most ground. Mm -hmm. Because they take away your ability to think about things and your ability to talk about things and your ability to make sort of impactful statements just by dominating those linguistic categories. Um, and so, you know, you can accuse either side of having uh, done it. And I think there are a lot more sides than two but just to kind of operate um, in the American idiom. Um, but that's my general thought on language is that those words, they're very injured and they're very much wounded. Um, and so in terms of media, I think you know, our project is one of rehabilitation. So I do a really annoying thing where I talk about words a lot in the things that I write, um, which I'm sure is like very boring to read and probably does not grab people. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to be very clear about what I mean and to try to return some of the lost meaning to those things and not see them. Um, so yeah, I mean, but it, it's going to cause any time in a liberal and it's sort of a little democracy when you decide that you're just going to like sort of, you know, uh, be very, very, very frank about what you think. It's going to cause some friction, right? Because the reason we don't do that is because it causes friction. <laughs> so. um, I was intrigued by your the question that you uh, presented at the beginning about whether or not Pope Francis is a Republican <coughs> or a Democrat. <laughs> and I think it's uh, an important question because it illustrates the narrowness of debate in the United States. And so uh, the origin of this kind of fake news that fits everything in this Procrustean bed of you're a Democrat or Republican when he clearly is neither. He's harshly critical of capitalism, neoliberal capitalism. He comes before the United States Senate and he talks about the arms industry and how its only purpose is money money that is soaked in blood. He presents as American heroes Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Dorothy Day, who had an abortion, and Thomas Merton. These clearly are beyond the categories of Republican and Democrat. And our debate in the United States is so limited by those, we forget that there's no Labor Party in the United States, no significant Green Party in the United States that has any political power, no Socialist Party, no Marxist or Communist Party, as there once was in the United States. But I'd like to uh, get your thoughts about that. But also, he's clearly partially critical of climate change deniers. How could he possibly be a Republican? How can he fit into that category? Well, right, Sophia, but the, the, I think it, um, when I did those kinds of pitches, I think to myself, like, hmm, was he a Jedi or a Sith? I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> not 
a disinteresting question, I guess, if you like <laughs> drinking with friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it was alarming also in the sense that things that are much older than liberalism are now being forced sort of backwards through that lens. So the way that people are understanding, and you know, Pope Francis, he's the Pope, um, so when people who are religious, be they Catholic or other Christians, when they're trying to see how he fits into this kind of liberal picture in American life, they're also looking at a reflection of themselves. And it's unfortunate because that's a very, very limited and distorted picture um, in many ways. And so that's kind of, that's one of the things that got me worried about the sort of, kind of the public reason, the public understanding of the self and the truth sort of getting flipped inside um, and the, the truth itself being sort of distanced altogether. So people who are looking at Francis or, or any, I mean, people will say all the similarly weird things like Jesus was a socialist. Um, I mean, I, I identify as a socialist myself, but I wouldn't say that. It's, it doesn't make any sense. It's not historical. I am, we talk about socialism, it wasn't happening. Um, it doesn't, it's hard to even understand what's going on there, but you can see that people are, have that, that outward lens on the inside. And they're trying to understand things which are, you know, eternal and profound truths through a provisional and limited lens. Um, and that's very disturbing to me. So, I mean, when I write about Francis, it's always been, you know, again, I have a very annoying approach to writing about Francis, which is to start off by saying, like, well, Republicans say he's a Republican because he's pro-life, and uh, he's sort of traditional on sexuality, and uh, Democrats will point to his position on climate change, his position on capitalism, um, as if Democrats have any problems with capitalism. <laughs> um, but doesn't make any sense. It's like trying to go into how Julius Caesar would have voted in the Democratic primary. <laughs> Once again, I, I think you can do it, but you're going to get less of an understanding than you would if you didn't adopt that frame. You're going to know less truth. Um, and so that's kind of been the frame that I've tried to adopt. If the United States it did have more parties, I think we would have better discourse. Um, I think people are pretty tribal by nature, and they're, they're very, um, they feel very attached <coughs> to their political groups, so I think a lot of the, what the media is is sort of theater for catharsis about your group. So you're like, yeah, my people were fighting their people, and we're winning today, and you know, they might win tomorrow, and you know, people who speak for me and my group, they, they make cool quips and zingers and stuff. Um, and it's just sort of theatrical in that way. And, um, and of course, the, this is a, a digression, but it's for people who don't actually have any control to feel like they have some power. Um, and so that's a, that's a whole another discussion, but it's hard to even start broaching that side of things unless you can first straighten out what do you really think the truth is about people, about reality, about the world, about politics. Um, and so I, I, I raise those questions as much as I can. Um, and, and people feel like they already know the answer, but what's really interesting to me, is, especially in interviewing people, when you actually ask them questions like that, they usually don't. I, I, uh, I debated a guy. Uh, Brian Kaplan is a professor of economics at George Mason University, the libertarian. I debated him at LibertyCon. I represented socialism, he represented capitalism. We had a debate in front of about, I think, 500 something libertarian college students. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I got the opportunity to ask him one question. And I asked him, How does a thing come to be property? He didn't know. Oh. <laughs> he was able to generate some things. He was able to, oh, well, you know, well, well there's kind of, I mean, it seems to be kind of good and like helps things function. And I have a sense that there must be a lot of cultures say there's property. And so, so, but this is on the spot intuitional generation. You should have known that a long time ago if you're a libertarian, how you acquire and what property is it a metaphysical relationship? Is it a relationship between me and you? Is it a relationship? Is it in the nature of the thing? Is it an ontological quality? Um, and these are the kind of things that. If you read ancient literature, people spend a lot of time on, which is like weird because they'll start off with like, well, as you know, everything is triangles. <laughs> but at least they're starting from the top. And they, they start at the very, very basis um, of the thing, and then they cycle upwards into like more and more particular questions, which I think is really useful and, and could be done a little bit more to avoid the narrowness of those kinds of categories, just Democrat and Republican. Although a multi-party system wouldn't necessarily address the gap between... No, no, no. I mean, you could have multi-party liberal democracies with similar problems. Yeah. I think that people, I think a multi-party system might take the pressure off a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
um, because part of the tension is intra-party, right? So like you have clearly a like right populist, and then you have what every other country would call liberals, but they're like stuck together in the Republican Party, and then you have the rest of the liberals <laughs> stuck with the Democrats, um, and some of whom are like kind of Marxian-leaning democratic socialists. Um, you know, that a very ugly primary, which was just a, a dim social primary versus liberals. Um, and, and I think it drives people nuts because these are the groups they really affiliate and identify with. These identities are very important to them, but they feel very unstable um, and very contentious. And so I think there's like a buildup of pressure. Um, and if people could just like, you know, take a deep breath and be like, you know what, these people, they're in the party with you, but they're different from you. It would be really nice if it was just two clean parties and you could be more like the people. Not that you're not going to get into that splitting the world, um, but at least that provides a kind of like pressure release. I, I would think, I hope. I lived in the UK for a while and they didn't seem to have exactly the same problems we do, but they're all, also allowed to yell in Parliament. Yes, so that <coughs> might also be one of the pressure releases. Um, you spoke a lot about sort of right left Republican Democrat. But the huge reality we face now is President Trump, who, who uses discourse in a way that's, to me, different than anybody in public life in America has in the past, where he routinely asserts as true things that any person, reasonable person, probably either, even himself, knows are absolutely not true. Yeah. So this is not an issue of hypocrisy. It's not the old Republican versus Democrat yeah. stuff. There's this other overlay that I don't think anybody knows what to do with, because it just introduces this this noise that's that's corrupting everything. Yeah, what Trump was able to do, um, and so if I was strategizing for a Democratic comm shop, I would say in 2020, run against the press. Right. Um, all Trump was able to do is um, pick up on the fact that everyone feels like they're being lied to all the time, and say to people, "Hey, I see that. I recognize it. You are being lied to all the time." And I'm going to double down okay. on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's, like, it's so easy to take shots at Trump that, I mean, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like his, the interesting thing that he provides, the thing that he was able to do is say, um, you know, there are people who are telling you things and they're arguing things and they're not being honest. Now, the ways in which they're not being honest are usually not the ways that he identifies, right? He's like, uh, actually, fake news, uh, you know, the master is now, actually is. Um, but he's correct in that there's a, there are overlays to stories about Trump or there are implications or insinuations that are being unstated um, and that people aren't being fully clear with you about why they're reporting on what they're reporting on. I mean, the Stormy Daniels thing is a good example, right? We're all going to have to do that. I mean, like, oh my God. Um, I would rather, like, give birth again and go through this down news cycle. <laughs> <laughs> to have to do it is not because anyone cares. Did Democrats, Democrats care? <laughs> I mean, he bought a service. Right? This is usually something that Democrats are uh, in favor of, you know, legalizing and making more humane this kind of industry, right? Uh, and certainly, no shortage of Democratic politicians have been involved in the same kind of thing in the past, some of whom aren't even, like, completely expelled from the party at this point. Um, so, I mean, no one actually cares. This is, kind of, this is an instrument by which they think they might be able to find some kind of fraud or crime by which they could force the political process of impeachment, which I guess they think Hillary um, is president after that, which is not how that works. Um, but, but that's really what's going on. And we're going to have to go through this whole disgusting news cycle, um, probably with pictures, um, precisely because it's thought that it could be a useful tool. And like, I wish that people would just say that. Right? They'd be like, I don't really care what President Trump did with Stormy Daniels. I sure hope he committed some kind of financial crime that we can get him impeached over. Um, and no one likes to hear that. It seems unfair. It's not what you'd want to hear from your press. But if that's actually what you're up to, then you might as well be clear about it. Because on the other side of it, all you open up to with this kind of like high moralism about it is one more opportunity for Trump to say, like, hey, they're not telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. People already sense it. I think that that was how he was able to access evangelicals. He would go up on the primary stage and say, I've paid off all these people. I've made contributions. So if there were like 16 candidates at one point, Trump was like, every one of them has been involved in politics. I've given money to. I own them all. And, and that's why there's no progress being made in politics, because they're, they're suborned, they're bought off by me. And that's not a nice thing to hear. Like, it's not the person you necessarily want in charge of you, but at least the person is being honest. 
about how politics actually works. So, I mean, a, a column I've been thinking about for a long time is like Trump is sort of like this prince of lies figure, but I think the really horrifying thing about him is he's compelling to a lot of people because of the truth he tells. In, in, in bizarre ways, but such as people are not being honest with you about what they really think, the controversies that are being made controversial are not actually controversial for the reasons that are being suggested to you, politics does not actually work on a democratic axis in the way that it seems like it does, it's completely owned, I mean, these are things that he was willing to come right out and say. Um, and I think that the truth itself is so moving to people that there's just a gravitational pull to something like that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I write about Trump a lot, and I, I think he's an interesting character. I guess the one question I have about him is, like, is this a one-off thing? Is this just, like, a strange episode in American history? We're not a very old country, so, like, we're due a lot more weird leaders. Um, <laughs> right, when you do it back, and you're like, well, I mean, you know, no clue, you know. Like, I mean, it could get a lot weirder. Um, and maybe once America <coughs> supposedly lasts a thousand years or whatever, I'm sure we'll have many weirder people than Trump and we're just in the early days of our history. Um, is it that, or is this now the way that liberal democracy is inclined? Is it going to be the case that from here on out, it's um, like pure solid theater, the expertise component has fallen off, and it's strictly about um, who can kind of puncture that veil uh, and, and, and get people attracted in a way that makes them feel like they might be empowered. Um, if that's the case, that's pretty disturbing. Um, and you can like, basically only hope for good celebrities. Um, like that becomes your whole political aspiration. It's like, I really hope a movie star wants health care for everyone. <laughs> Otherwise, we're screwed. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I haven't been able to see the end of it yet, so I don't know. But um, I'm excited to be like relatively young, but I want to see how this thing pans out. Um, so I'm looking forward to that quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm going to sit down if that's okay. Please. Uh, remarkable for its eloquence and precision. I really appreciate uh, your coming to, to share with us. Uh, I also really appreciate sort of taking down liberalism from the inside. Um, in a lot of ways, the, the, the reading of liberalism, and I'm unsure of this, but it almost sounds like a postmodern reading of liberalism. Um, it almost sounds, it sounds even more to me like a feminist reading of liberalism, and uh, the, the parallels there, uh, just, the feminist reading has always been, you can't bracket gender, right? That, that, that public reasons, one of the things public reasons do is they push gender outside of the, 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 the sphere of public reasons that which only perpetuates problems of gender. So feminists have said we have to thematize questions of gender, no more public reasons. Postmodernists, if you'll forgive the loose use of the term, say so you can't bracket questions of power, right? And you, uh, sort of uh, analogously, you can't bracket questions of truth or, or foundational commitments. And so I'm wondering if, sort of underlying all these varieties uh, of critiques of liberalism, is that perhaps the issue is not the distance between public reasons and what you really think, perhaps. The, the real problem here that all three of these critiques speak to is that liberalism, particularly as we get it through Rawls and Rorty, it's a process-driven thing, right? And that anyone who's committed to substance, be they feminists, Roman Catholics, evangelicals, anyone with any commitment to substantive politics is going to always be frustrated with this process uh, vision of liberalism if that's not some sort of intractable yeah. uh, problem. I think that's exactly right. Uh, my reading of liberalism, um, it comes to like vis a vis John Milbank. Yeah, sure, yeah. So, my theology tutor at Cambridge was John Milbank's student. Um, so, the whole Christian socialist thing, it's, um, it's just a weird Cambridgean thing that's like still kind of boiling over there, as far as I know. Um, so, like, be on the lookout for more like unreadable doorstop books um, about the truth. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the way in which I got my like, brain permanently broken, where like, you can't interact in public life in a normal way anymore, because like, once you see liberalism, it's always in the picture. And like, you're trying to engage in public reason, but you know that you're like, doing kabuki. Um, and so like, I don't think that most people who write about politics are aware of that, um, but I am. So that's why my stuff is like, unreadable. Um, I think that the proceduralism of liberalism, yeah, I mean, it's, 
it returns to that problem of truth, right? That the first substantive commitment of liberalism is no substantive commitments. However, it's lying about that. And I think that's what Fortier gets at really well, is that Rawls tries to distinguish between political liberalism, which has no substantive commitments to truth, is sort of metaphysically neutral, as he puts it, and enlightenment liberalism. Those guys were more than happy to be like, no Catholics, all right? And they were not wrong. They were like, you guys have something inside you that prevents you from doing what I want you to do. And that is, you have a substantive commitment that I disagree with, I and mean, I can't tolerate it, and you cannot be part of a liberal society. Over time, uh, you know, liberalism, it, it continues to liberalize, and so those barriers went away, and we move on from like an enlightenment liberalism, which is pretty open about its substantive commitments, to a political liberalism that is much more quiet about them, to like a Rorty's postmodern liberalism, which claims it doesn't have them whatsoever. Um, and so all that's left is the proceduralism of liberal governance. We, we follow these rules. And I think what's so frustrating to people about that, some of whom have sort of substantive commitments, uh, so Carol Pateman is like one of the great feminist critics, a uh, favorite of mine of, of sort of contractarian liberalism. <coughs> um, what's frustrating is I'm in this argument with someone and I'm saying, uh, they're saying, I have procedural commitments. I'm committed to a system of norms that I think that preserve peace and fairness and equality. And that's how we conduct liberal governments. And I have to respond like, A, it's not working. It's not actually preserving any kind of consensus. And B, you're not telling the truth. You are not simply committed to procedures. There's more going on with you than you think. And I don't know if they don't realize that, which I think is the case sometimes with certain liberal thinkers. Um, and I think Rawls was a very honest broker. I don't think he was trying to hide the ball at all. Um, I also think he was a very unusual liberal, um, which is what the communitarians in the 80s, 90s said about him. Um, but there is a truth there. There are substantive truths there. There are, there are conceptions of the good hidden in there that have to be unearthed, and you can't really have an honest discussion about it until they are. So uh, it's, it's, you're in a crazy situation where you're frustrated by the proceduralism and you also know that what you're dealing with is not strict proceduralism. There's more to it than that. There are substantive commitments. Um, and, and it's like pulling teeth, trying to unearth them. Um, but also really fun and interesting. And I mean, you know, it, it's hard because things are so polarized and people are very, politics has become very personal to people, you know, not wrongly. Um, but trying to like draw out of people um, like, what do you really think? And what do you really, really think? What do you really think? What does that mean? What does this mean? Um, it's, it's, it's an impossible task, so you just have to do it yourself. Right? It's like you have this horrible, painful procedure you want to perform, and no one will let you. <laughs> so you have to just start on yourself. Um, and then I think that can build sort of trust if, if, if you're dealing with students or if you're dealing with readers um, in a way that allows you to start drawing it out of them. That's my hope, at least. But yeah, I, mean, I think the procedural element of liberalism is one of the frustrating ones. It's just like not the final boss. It's, it's like but slightly before. <laughs> that's, really, that's really insightful. There's a question over uh, I, I do have, uh, I do think that there's some mischaracterization of roles a little bit here in the sense that if we were to say go back to one of his sources, which would be Kant. Kant has a very interesting essay called um, The Idea of the Universal History of the Cosmopolitan Intent. And one of the things that uh, Kant focuses on is this need to sort of move liberal democratic societies from what he calls a modus vivendi, you know, a kind of Hobbesian agreement that we make for a society, to what he calls um, from, from a pathological agreement to a moral whole. And it seems to me that that, that indicates something more substantive than merely a procedure. I mean, Rawls may characterize public reason as um, a process and so forth, but it seems to me that he has in mind something like Hamilton talks about, and I, I can't remember exactly where, I'm, I'm going to say somewhere around Federalist 15, where he says the point of the union is not just to help everybody be safer and be better, but to help people realize that from the standpoint of the union, that's the point that citizens have to take. It seems to me that what Rawls has in mind is something like that to kind of lift us from those narrow uh, sources of, of interest that guide us on the local and the state level to also realize that there are some larger interests that govern. I think Lincoln is an example of somebody who, who 
sort of trades on this. And, and so I think, um, I was just wondering if you'd ever thought of Rawls as having something more substantive than that, given the kind of political history we have. I know, I think, I think, I, I agree with Blair. I think Rawls is, um, to the degree that he is characterized as metaphysically neutral by himself, he is not, right? I mean, he, he has substantive commitments that he himself perhaps is not as forward about. Maybe the, the finer point to put on it is his distinction between enlightenment liberalism and political liberalism is less clear cut than he would have suggested. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's always strikes me odd liberal political theory to, to hear about, I mean, so you know, sort of restate what you're saying, to move citizens to that point of higher consideration of the entire union. Um, would be or, or to give them some larger set of interests, right. with, which may sort of extend them beyond their comprehensive views. Right. Liberal societies have to make liberal subjects to keep liberalism going. Um, and that's that process. So that's what I'm talking about when I say that public reason, just participating in it, it not only changes how you interact, but it changes your insides, right? I mean, it changes your own relationship to what you understand to be fully true because it gives you this set of commitments and interests that are very high, they're very big, they're very lofty, um, and they're at a distance and a separation from what you ideally or are not ideally, but what you also might identify as your huge, overwhelming set of interests. So are your huge, overwhelming set of interests um, the, you know, the furtherance of this particular political union, uh, the good of the people in it, um, or, or does it have to do with um, your uh, connection to, say, your religious body uh, or your eternal life? You have those two things which, which yeah. have to meet somehow, and they both make the same claims about themselves. Can, can I, just, I, I, don't, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. I have one more follow-up sure. here. So I remember Rand Paul, um, when he was thinking about running for president, I can't remember whether this is in 2014 or 2015, but he had that interview in which somebody said, well, what do you think about this, uh, uh, about these, uh, about the fact that a restaurant cannot uh, refuse service to people on the basis of race? Yeah. And a very libertarian answer is, well, if that's the way somebody feels, then we can't stop them from doing that. But, that we made a mistake in saying that you have to stop segregated restaurants or, mm -hmm. or, or these sorts of things. Uh, is is that what are those are those the kinds of things that um, uh, we can't ask people to sort of get beyond? Uh, it seems to me that Rawls, and here's what I think is very interesting about Rawls is he's trying to sort of get us to see that we have larger commitments, and it may force us to change some of those more deeply held convictions that we have. Um, that that's part of being a, a, a democratic society. Deeply held. So, so what do you think Rawls' answer would be to the question that was posed to Ron to Ron Paul? I think Rawls would would suggest that uh, he's wrong. Why? Because from the point of because I, I think he would say, look, if you're part of a democratic society and you believe in rights, you cannot deny people rights um, simply based on the color of their skin, their sexual orientation. Um, people have a right to eat in restaurants. Pardon? People have a right to eat in restaurants. Yeah, in, in the public sphere. Look, if I don't want to invite them into my house, I don't have to do that. Why? Pardon? Why? If you believe in rights. Well, um, I mean, because I'm not violating their right to, um, they don't have a right to come into my house and demand that I feed them. But the, your house is part of the public sphere. I mean, they certainly can't command the restaurant here to feed them either. They have to pay. I, I don't think that, that my house would be part of the public sphere. The house is part that. of the private world. Pardon? The house, the house is part of the private world where right. you have these other convictions. Right, I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But in the public sphere, I cannot engage in behavior mm -hmm. um, um, where uh, I would undermine the rights. You know, if I'm running a business, I can't say, look, I'm not going to hire you because you're a woman. Right. Or I, I'm not going to hire somebody because they're Catholic. So we'll dispense with, we're not talking about legally you can't, we're talking about morally. You're, as, a, as a moral liberal subject, you cannot do such a thing as say no black people can eat in this restaurant. But as a moral liberal subject, can you do such a thing as say I'll never have a black guest? In, in your own home? Yeah. I, I would imagine you can. But uh, why? I don't understand. That's, I guess, where I fall from Rawls. Mm -hmm. Is I, I don't see how those convictions 
which apply to this public sphere. I mean, we know those are very modern distinctions, public and private. I'm asking what it means to be a moral person. And I think that you can be a moral restaurant owner, and a moral restaurant owner would not say black people can't eat at my establishment. And also, that same restaurant owner has a home. And it would be no more moral for him to go home and say, I won't have a black guest. But the liberal order imposes this distinction between public and private, which seems to me really artificial, and it causes people to be at odds with themselves, to think of themselves as home to two vastly different sets of values. But, but the alternative would then be to say, look, you can't do what you want in your own home. So for example, if we don't think you should have contraception, you can't have it. Well, no, it would say, you cannot be a moral person and say you don't have black guests. You are wrong for doing that. But I don't think Rawls is suggesting that he wants to impose those. I, and I, I, I apologize. Oh, no, no, but that's interesting. <laughs> that's very interesting. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it quite a bit. These are the things I think about quite often. And actually, when I talk to my husband, we'll often, um, this is so sad, but we'll be like, you be Rawls and I'll be so and so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have like a, we'll have a go back and forth. Yeah. Exactly like that. Um, you know, okay. yeah, it's, it's role playing. It's like not the way people do it. <laughs> Right, you be your son, I'll be back, and we'll sort out the civil um, And I think that's like a very, very, very useful kind of argument um, because it puts people emotionally in the position of their of their interlocutor, right? So, um, and I think that that helps bring out for me, which is why I appreciate our conversation that we just had so much, is because uh, I try to think about how these things kind of impact your interior world. Um, and your emotional relationship to the, to the things that you're proposing and believing and thinking about yourself. And those kinds of exchanges really help. So I appreciate that. And I hope I somehow answered the question. <laughs> yeah, and I apologize, because I, I just realized as I was not, talking that I was all. taking up time. I appreciate so. it. But it's well, a good time conversation time. that we can continue, but yeah. we'll make space for one more opening for a conversation. And um, sure. uh, just to pull back from from sort of the deepness and be a bit more topical here. Well, let's see people in the room, maybe. Um, so, so when I'm trying to make sense of, of you know, the Trump era and, and Trump being president and, and sort of these distinctions between, uh, you know, the space between truth and, and sort of this, like, disenfranchised internal self where you're not being able to maybe express it and how we move forward and bridge those gaps. In a, in a certain way, I think, uh, as a young person, I, I look towards making sense of Donald Trump being our president as, um, and I, you know, I try to get into the emotions and see, you know, what's creating this engagement with this type of person. Uh, and so in, in certain ways, I guess I'm, I'm, part of me is trying to make sense of it, and, and maybe I think that uh, a good way to look at it or potentially a good way to move forward is, is you know, for me, I think that maybe it's a good thing that he is president because it seems as if that is more authentic and true to, he represents maybe more of the thought process and the critical uh, thinking um, and knowledge base for America as a whole, which is a large, very, very, you know, on a scale, large democracy. And so I think for a long time, there's been this disconnect. We've had politicians who've been, you know, uh, Basically, I, what I think is that I think that Trump represents a lot of America, whether we like it or not. And so maybe this is a good starting point to say, okay, well, actually, this is this is where, as a collective, some of some of our identity and some of our ideas are. And you know, and this you know, he represents a lot of people in America. And so maybe this can be a moving forward point for for other people to engage and say, okay, well, you know, again, he is pulling back the curtain in certain ways and saying this is this and this is that. And so. So then maybe, you know, with him being who he is and so unabashedly uh, himself, it, maybe that's a, a point to, uh, to engage with and move past maybe some of the, the veil projections of you know, like a nice politician who, you know, uh, is clean and, and smooth. And so in a certain way, I'm hopeful because I think that, uh, you know, this will be an opportunity for us to, to kind of uh, to get more to where we actually are as a whole and then maybe move forward and develop a, a more a complex uh, complex engagement with their process. No, I like that. I mean, uh, that, was the, uh, that was like the hot accelerationist take during the election, which was, uh, or accelerationist being people who are like, the whole thing needs to be destroyed and it's speed up, so it's a net good. Um, who are like, these are the most enjoyable people that I read. Um, <laughs> they're at least really fun, um, which is like an undervalued political virtue, I think, being funny and different. Um, 
Yeah, and I, but I think that maybe the point you raise is that if there is a problem with the way that we're conducting politics, going along to get along is only going to delay the inevitable. And like having some kind of crisis at least puts us in a position to kind of reevaluate. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that Trump is a, it represents a crisis, um, he's almost like a, like a joke, like something Aristotle would make up to be like, well, if you have just straight up democracy, you'll just get this. And he'd be like, oh, it's not reasonable. But like, um, actually, yeah. And, um, and so it's a point where we can kind of reevaluate well, <coughs> democracy, uh, you know, we, we have this contractarian story about why governments have power, and um, maybe it turns out consensus is not super reliable, um, and or not reliable for certain things, or maybe we have kind of elapsed in our duties to form a good consensus, right? People are not best as unmediated moral subjects. Um, they need sculpture. And uh, that's another hard thing to kind of confront liberalism with, but you're going to be, I think, presented in Trump with a set of choices, right? And you're going to get, you know, so here you've got straight up consent, you've got straight up democracy, uh, you have uh, consensus. You can only keep some of these because it's clear that, like, keeping them all is causing a situation you really don't like if you're a person who's critical of Trump. Um, and so you're going to have to kind of choose among those things. And so that process of trying to prioritize those political values is one that I find really interesting that Trump has prompted. Um, even the, I mean, I even, I guess I have a kind of limited and dim hope for this horrible Stormy Daniels thing and like the, um, the many stories just like it that are probably going to follow, which is like if, if some people really want to say something about public morality, that they feel like, well, I don't want to impose that on someone else, or, well, Clinton, you know, like, now's the time, man. Like, if you've got a hot take, mm -hmm. there's no time like the present because it's Trump, so everything is kind of being treated as new again. Um, so there's a real opening for kind of sort of avant-garde and unusual interventions um, into public discourse. Um, and even odd publications are popping, like American Affairs I like a lot. I think the guy, one of the kids who ran it, maybe endorsed Trump or something. Um, but it's interesting, it's iconoclastic, I mean, and not just for the sake of it, right? It's, it's interested in ideas that are old, um, but it's interested in revisiting them in a sort of light of new events. And so, to the degree that Trump can prompt that, yeah, I don't think it's a problem to call that a benefit. Um, even if you're a person who's generally very critical of Trump, I don't think it's a problem to call that a benefit of his administration. Well, we have run a little bit past our time, but no. The, we, I think most of us would love to run even further, but we, we um, have a schedule to keep to to some extent. So let's thanks a little bit.